um, regrettably, because of the pandemic, we still have to conduct a lot, in fact, most of our events online. And this is, of course, the first of the uh, China Institute seminar program. And I'm delighted today is that we have a very interesting speaker who will talk on a um, important subject that some will find it controversial, others may well find it very insightful. But either way, you will be encouraged to engage with the speaker in the usual spirit that we conduct debate at SOAS. Our speaker is, of course, Kai uh, Strymata. And Kai is a very distinguished journalist who is currently based in Copenhagen. And if I'm not mistaken, Kai, you are a German national yes. uh, who has a long career in um, German journalism and had spent a long time working in countries where democracy is, to say the least, imperfect. And that includes both Turkey and China. And Kai has spent two long periods of time in China. I think the first time you worked as a journalist in China was from the middle of the 1990s. 1997, uh, actually. Um. The Not return of Hong Kong to the motherland was basically my first assignment. Yes. Indeed. And then you were there for a bit less than 10 years. Then you went to Turkey and then returned to China. So you were reporting in China when Zhang Jimin was leader in China, when Hu Jintao was leader in China. And in your second tour, it was when Xi Jinping became leader of China, which provides the kind of perspective that I think uh, will be mentioned in the talk that you will be um, presenting later. And if I am not mistaken, you will be speaking based on the research you conducted for this book. Uh, we have been harmonized, which yeah. came out, uh, was it last year or the year before? Last year. Last year, came out last year. and. The American edition is just out one month now. Indeed. And the subject that you are going to be talking to us today is the reinvention of dictatorship, which I understand is the German title for the same book issued in Germany. Now, with that, I will hand over to you, Kai, and then when we have uh, finish with your presentation, I will invite uh, participants, whether you are on the Zoom or whether you're on the live feed through uh, Facebook, to put your questions to me, which and I will uh, try to put all the questions that I can collect to Kai, uh, time permitting. Uh, if not, then I will have to try to group them together and uh, if I, in the end, have to leave out any, I do apologize for that. Over to you, Kai. Thanks a lot, Steve. Thanks a lot for having me. Um, as you pointed out correctly, I've been working as a journalist in China since 1997. I actually also studied uh, Sinology uh, in Germany. So uh, I went there for the first time in the mid 80s and uh, it's amazing. It's like uh, more than 30 years have passed. And, uh, you know, I come from a little village in the Bavarian Alps. And one of my main reasons I saw to get out of there and to see the world and to see China was that Europe back at the time felt like a place where, where Germany at least felt like a place where nothing ever happened. You know, everything was so quiet and peaceful. And, I mean, especially in this place where I grew up and um, I really wanted to experience something. And um, well, China, China more than enough fulfilled that promise. It was like I felt all those times, all those 30 years as a student, as an observer and later as a journalist that actually 
really, even objectively speaking, this was the most exciting place on the planet to be for any observer, be it, a, be it an academic, be it an artist, a writer, a journalist. Um, really amazing the changes that this place uh, has gone through. And actually, you know, I left China then uh, in the November of 2018. And when I left, I mean, I was tired a little bit, I have to admit, because it is also exhausting to work there as a journalist. But still, at the same time, I felt the same excitement right until the very last minute and the very last second. And actually, when I stood in Hong Kong, I didn't leave by plane. I took the train, uh, uh, the fast train, the high-speed train to Hong Kong, to Kowloon, to the new station there. And when I got off there, I really felt, okay, I've left a country that is maybe now even more, it's even more exciting what's happening there than it actually has been for all those years. It's really mind-blowing, actually. Also, what we've seen uh, in the last 12 months only, um, uh, you know, starting with the developments in Hong Kong later, November last year only was the big revelations with the China cables uh, uh, about the camps in Xinjiang, the re-education camps for the Uyghurs. Uh, I think we've already forgotten about all these things because so many of these things happening. Uh, and then it was Corona. And with all these developments, uh, you found China on the title pages, on the front pages of the newspapers and magazines and and uh, in the top of the news hours in TV stations. And this is really something that is very different from what from what uh, it was like when I started out as a student of uh, Chinese back then, because, or, or even as a reporter in 1997, you know, back then, when you when you wrote about China, when you spoke about China, you spoke about China. Now it's completely different. Now if you speak about China, and when you write about China, you speak and write at the same time also about us, also about Europe. Suddenly China is in the midst of everything. It's in the middle of the world back again and it's in our midst and it really everything that happens in China suddenly has a meaning also uh, for our lives and for our politics and this is very very um, it's a big change um, in all those years that I've experienced now uh, what we're what we're seeing now really uh, in the United States reminds me uh, uh, Donald Trump and the re-election coming up reminds me a little bit when I started the book because uh, in November, I started the book in November 2016. I started the thought, harboring the thought of writing this book. Uh, and actually it started off not necessarily because I really felt the urge to write about, you know, like every correspondent does, uh, before you leave, you have to write the China book. But on the contrary, it really started off with a with a very strong feeling about what I saw was going on in the United States and what was happening also in Germany. And talking, speaking to my friends, speaking to my uh, colleagues, uh, I actually, you know, the book sort of, uh, it forced itself upon me the night Donald Trump was elected. That was really the moment when I thought, okay, wow, there's something happening. There's something happening. Not only in China, what I've been with, witnessing all those years, but there's also something happening in the United States, in Europe at the same time, um, in the midst of our democracies, something happening with the European Union, with Europe, with liberal democracy. And China somehow has something to do with it. You know, I still remember, I mean, back then there was big people acted really surprised you know when they when they when they were talking about donald trump and and his lying for example and everybody was like wow incredible why does he do that and how does he do that and how is he not ashamed of lying in the way he does because the lies were so obvious and they were so shameless i mean you know him saying that uh, uh, having the biggest inauguration of all times, the biggest crowd, the masses, you know, and everybody with access to the internet could just with one click, you know, you had both pictures, uh, Barack Obama's inauguration and Trump's inauguration. And it was so obvious that he was lying. And I remember that pe people were really scratching their head. And why is he doing this? And, and they started calling him a pathological liar. And I was sitting there in China with uh, all my experience of having lived in China and having lived in Turkey. And I was like, no, 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 you don't get it. You know, I know what this guy is doing. I've seen it. I've lived it. Alternative facts, fake news, all these 
terms that now you know we're we're sort of uh, we're annoyed when we hear them because we've heard them so often. But four years ago, when Trump was elected, actually they were quite new again in our vocabulary, and people weren't used to them anymore in liberal democracies. And 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 and. Uh, but to me, it was it was so obvious. I thought I can tell you what this guy is doing because this is something that autocrats all over the world have been doing since the beginning of times and autocrats and would-be autocrats. He's, you, he's not a pathological liar, as you would call him. His lies are not pathological. They're systematic and strategic. And uh, this is something uh, uh, people living in autocracies know all too well. And this is something the Chinese know all too well. And they've known it for, 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 for a millennia, you know? I mean, the famous story of the son of Qin Shi Huangdi and his chancellor, uh, leading a deer into court and telling all the people, uh, 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 you know, and everybody was really astonished, all his ministers standing there, what is this guy doing? And him telling the emperor, majesty, you know, showing him the deer and, and telling him, majesty, may I present you this beautiful horse? And everybody was like, what? You know? And then, uh, of course, we all know, uh, we as students of Chinese history, we know what happened uh, is like all the ministers who dared to speak out, this is not a horse, this is a deer. They were, you know, being led away and executed. And the next batch to be executed were the ministers who stayed silent and only the ones who, who, who joined in, uh, uh, you know, exclaiming, oh, what a beautiful horse this is, only they were the ones surviving in the end. And the Chinese even have a Chen Yu for that uh, uh, saying until today, it's, it's, it's part of their language. Zhi Lu Wei Ma, yeah, make, the, make a horse out of the deer. So they know exactly what it means. So take a lie and use it not for convincing people, but use it to submit them, to confuse them and uh, to force them into submission. So I actually thought, and this was only one example of things I saw uh, going on in the States, but also back home in Germany and Britain, all in European countries with the right wing populism rising. And I suddenly, I saw things um, coming back in our countries or, uh, uh, that actually I knew from having lived in Turkey in a half authoritarian uh, state and in China in a full, uh, uh, full dictatorship. And I thought, I need to explain, I want to explain people about the mechanisms of dictatorship. And I want to write a book about mechanisms of dictatorship because it's not only uh, uh, important for China watchers to know what's going on in China, it's also important for people in Europe to actually uh, uh, see um, uh, what's happening in their own countries. So China actually uh, being connected uh, to them now in two ways, maybe, you know, one as a mirror for things going on in their own countries. And secondly, also because as we enter the new era, Xi Jinping having declared the new era, China suddenly um, wanting to have its own role uh, in the center of the world back. So. When I started off, I wanted to do a book about the mechanisms of dictatorship, and that meant, you know, the old mechanisms like the lying, the fake news, the propaganda, censorship, but also things like, um, like uh, the collective amnesia, make people forget everything that has happened uh, uh, only maybe a year or two or 10 years or 30 years before, or maybe two months ago, you know, like they did this again with the Corona crisis, only two months after they fucked up really badly, suddenly uh, the propaganda narrative was we are the best Corona fighters in the world and uh, trying to make people forget uh, again. So this was uh, when I started off with the book, I thought, okay, I'm going to write a book about China because this is what I know. So, but it's going to be about mechanisms in a universal way about mechanisms of of uh, uh, dictatorship. And also I felt this really important because I felt not only did people in Europe and, uh, uh, and in other democracies, Western democracies not really get completely what was going on in their own countries, but, or they were missing some things, but at the same time, they were also missing what was going on in China since Xi Jinping had uh, come to power, which, uh, in my feeling back then already was changing into a completely new thing. You know, Xi Jinping was really serious when he was saying we're, we're going to create a new era. This was not the China anymore 
that, um, and this is not the China anymore, that people of my generation have grown up with that all of us have come accustomed to. And this is a difficulty I see uh, with many German uh, and other European politicians and business uh, people that it took them very long to realize that actually something substantial had changed. And in my view, uh, then, um, well, Xi Jinping was the guy mainly responsible for these changes. I, and I wanted to uh, basically write an analysis uh, what kind of changes he had been up to. And so in the end, my book that was supposed in the beginning to be about classical mechanisms of dictatorship uh, on the example of China, turned out to have three, roughly three uh, parts that, were, that are equally important. And the classical mechanisms of dictatorship are only the first part. So I would argue, uh, and I have argued that really this China is, um, is changing into something that the world actually hasn't seen before and it's really a completely new creature that we that we start to deal with and the first thing that xi jinping has done the first new thing which is actually a quite old thing is that he has brought back repression and restriction of freedoms in a way that we haven't seen in china actually for decades and that was quite stunning i still remember you know all of us uh, I came to China in the summer of 2012, so basically I came to Beijing together with Xi Jinping, you could say. Um, I, I witnessed the transition period, which was really extremely fascinating. And so Xi Jinping taking power, becoming the party chairman in, in November of 2012. Um, uh, 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 sorry, 12. I'm speaking about 2012. 2016 was when I started the book. But I came to China back for my second stay spent in the summer of 2012, and Xi Jinping taking over in November 2000, uh, of that year, November 2012. And um, I, I would say nobody that I know of actually could, was, could have expected was what was happening then. I think it surprised all of us, and it surprised all of us foreign correspondent, but it surprised also, I think, all my interview partners that I spoke to, and also the ones, actually party members, people in the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences, people like this, I think nobody, I, many of them didn't harbor any great illusions that he would be a reformer or something, but nobody actually, I think, really believed that he would be capable of such, uh, such uh, uh, quick and strong and incredible, uh, uh, measures like changing the party in the way he does mm, as he actually did. So what did he do? He actually, basically what we're seeing now, the China today is no longer the China of Deng Xiaoping of reform and opening policy. He, that actually is gone. What did Deng Xiaoping do back then? In reaction to uh, to the catastrophe and the suffering that Mao Zedong brought onto the country, Deng Xiaoping went on in decentralizing politics, he, he established a collective leadership in the party. He gave um, a local and regional power structures room to experiment freedom. Uh, he, he obviously gave uh, the economy freedom. He, he, he actually uh, did away with ideology in a, in, a, in a meaningful sense. You know, we all know, we all remember the sentence, it doesn't matter whether a cat is black or white. Uh, the most important thing is that it catches mice. So uh, Marx, while it was still being preached officially, it wasn't really important in everyday life and uh, and uh, nobody really cared a lot about I ideology. So power still was important, obviously, but it was much more decentralized. And Xi Jinping and one man rule had gone and the cult of personality had gone. And all these were, uh, of course, preconditions for the econom economic miracle that uh, China actually experienced, the pragmatism, uh, um, the really, um, the room for experiments and all this. We had a much freer e economy. We had, uh, together with the economy, probably something Deng Xiaoping didn't really want, but that was the proverbial fly coming into the open window. We had a much freer uh, society also uh, springing up. We had civil society. Uh, we had, well, all these great people were suddenly that, that we as reporters were, uh, were uh, 
able to meet in China, uh, were, were able to do their things, intellectuals, academics, um, really doing independent research, journalists being able to do to do uh, really courageous reporting, some magazines, some uh, newspapers actually really pushing the limits, even though if they nominally were still part of the party empire. Uh, 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 and all this probably was what led illusion among some of us, some of our business people, some of our politicians, well, you know, the China fantasy, wow, China, it looks as if this country is actually, aren't they going to be like us someday? So, uh, and uh, Xi Jinping, he finally did away with this illusion. He changed a lot. He actually, uh, he re-centralized power. He brought back repression in a way we haven't seen for a long time. He made the journalists toe the line. Uh, again, many uh, of my Chinese journalist friends uh, actually gave up their jobs in the last years. Many independent magazines and newspapers are no longer independent. They all have to bear, the, their family name has to be party now again. So there's no room for investing, not a lot of room for investigative or free uh, reporting anymore. Civil society as we knew it for many years and those things that we actually loved about China, uh, a lot of that has gone under Xi Jinping because he just did away with all these powers. He has re-centralized power, he has brought back one-man rule, and he has brought back the cult of personality. He has brought back ideology, not only Marx, he's talking uh, about Marx uh, as much as none of his predecessors has probably uh, since Mao Zedong. Uh, that doesn't mean everybody believes in Marx, but, uh, Everybody has to pretend, or at least people inside the party, they have to go to these uh, lectures again uh, in the Dunways, in the universities, in the think tanks. Again, you have to do Marxism schoolings like weekly or monthly, and you have to at least pretend um, uh, uh, to uh, believe in these things again. At the same time, uh, uh, Xi Jinping thought uh, 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 schools and faculties are springing up in universities all around the country. He's the first leader since Mao Zedong, Mao Zedong that, who has his thinking actually enshrined in the party constitution and in the state constitution. Uh, what does that mean? That's very obvious. If you criticize Xi Jinping, you're automatically um, uh, an enemy of the party and an enemy of the state. So all these things that he has done, um, they're very, let's say they're new for us as a generation, but of course, uh, in the bigger picture, uh, they're, you could say, in a way, back to the 1950s, you know? Uh, it's like this, um, he's, he, he, he's, it seems that he's dreaming of this pure, non-corrupt socialism full of ideals uh, that uh, maybe was supposed to be ruling in China before Mao Zedong actually kicked off the Cultural Revolution. So this is this is what he does with one foot. He's, he goes back in time. He goes back to the past. Now socialist socialist regimes that go back to a socialist to a Leninism from the 1950s. He speaks a lot about Marx, but in his I would say you know he it's Marx on his lips, but in his bones he's actually a Leninist. It's about power in the end. Uh, the Leninist socialist countries uh, of the 90 with structures from the 1950s, we've, we've seen a lot uh, on the planet and most of them have not survived, so we, we wouldn't have to worry a lot about them. But at the same time, he's doing another thing, or he's doing several other things. And one of the most important developments I would say that I've witnessed in the last two or three years of, of me being there as a reporter and... Um, and that's actually why I very quickly realized this book has to be has to have another uh, a core. Actually, is uh, he started? He he was trying uh, to actually introduce 20th century first uh, uh, 21st century information technology and its radically new possibilities for control and manipulation into the political structure and basically reinvent dictatorship for the information age. Do it with artificial, not only with the internet and with social media, but also with artificial intelligence and uh, big data. And actually I spent most of my, the last two years uh, of my work uh, in China then 
researching this part because suddenly it was like, you know, the artificial intelligence strategy of the Chinese State Council was introduced in the spring of 2017. And in that strategy, it says uh, very clearly uh, that they want to uh, catch up uh, with the leading technology nations of the planet, meaning obviously the United States by 2025. And they want to be number one in 2030 already. And of course, that's a very ambitious goal. But as we've seen very often in the case of China, you know, if they uh, and the Communist Party, if they if they don't lack in ambition sometimes, and they certainly, if they have identified a certain goal once, they don't lack in speed and determination. And there was actually an, an explosion of activities uh, 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 around artificial intelligence, starting from the beginning of 2017. That was mind blowing as well. And suddenly, all these startups springing up and money raining from the skies. It was uh, uh, suddenly um, the promised land of artificial intelligence suddenly no longer seemed to be Silicon Valley, but uh, uh, suddenly it was China. And people uh, like uh, scientists, programmers, uh, engineers uh, with of Chinese origin coming back from Silicon Valley into, uh, into startups in Beijing, Shenzhen, and other places, but also Americans, uh, 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 who didn't have Chinese origins, because suddenly, it, for some of them, there was more money to be made in China than in America. And not only was there more money to be made, but as one of my interview partners, a manager of uh, uh, the startup Sense Time, one of those uh, face recognition startups who produce these uh, cameras, surveillance cameras, as he told me. And you know, these people, when you speak to them, they look exactly like their counterparts in the United States. They're like 30 something, they wear Nike sneakers and jeans and they're completely, they haven't slept for three years. And so they're, 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 they're very exhausted, but at the same time, completely enthusiastic. Oh, and it's incredible what we're doing here is like all the science fiction stuff that you've seen in movies, we, we, we're, we're actually making it true here. And uh, all of them actually will, uh, will admit that in technologically, in many, many ways, they're still not as far as their American counterparts. But what they all say is uh, then at the same time, when it comes to practical applications, you know, this guy, for example, from Sense Time, this manager, he told me, we are already number one. And why is that? Because our government supports us, because we don't have these restrictions that you have in America or in uh, Europe, meaning mostly, uh, of course, privacy, uh, data pr protection uh, um, restrictions. So suddenly this enthusiasm uh, and this money, and of course, part of it was, uh, it's part of the, an economic plan. They want to use artificial intelligence and big data to catapult their economy into the 21st century because it is a big part of their legi uh, leg leg legitimacy that they have to uh, give uh, people material wealth and they want to continue uh, uh, economic growth. And they know they only can do this if they use new technologies. Uh, but at the same time, uh, and they don't even hide this, it's also uh, written very clearly that they will use this as measures for social governance uh, as they, or social management as they often call it, which uh, of course means uh, uh, surveillance, actually. So Xi Jinping might be the first ruler in the history of autocratic rulers who who actually can fulfill the age-old dream of all those rulers to actually, in the end, maybe with these means, uh, uh, gain really total and complete control uh, over uh, every single movement and maybe even over every single thought. Uh, of their subjects. At least uh, I think uh, this is also part uh, part of what they're aiming for. So uh, one thing that's very interesting in all this is that also another fantasy from the West was uh, blown into pieces. And that's the fantasy by all these uh, high-tech uh, prophets that have been telling us for decades uh, with every new technology there was, I think it started with, you know, satellite TV was the first time they told us that, that all these new technologies, actually they have it in them, in their DNA, that they will subvert authoritarian regimes and that they will freedom to the law, they will bring freedom to the last corner of the planet and no authoritarian regime is going to resist the freedom that comes on the back of these technologies. Then it was mobile phones that were supposed to be freedom, to bring freedom everywhere. Then it was the internet, social media, 
And of course, as we uh, China watchers have known for many years already, uh, not only does the Chinese government, the Communist Party, not fear these new technologies uh, any longer, but on the opposite, they have learned to love them long ago, and they have really jumped on the uh, on the bandwagon uh, a long time ago. And they have realized that if you have the resources, and they have shown us that if you are the party with the resources, you are actually the ones you uh, who can, in the end, um, use these instruments uh, to your will and you don't have to be afraid of them if you balance your politics in the right way they have to they have shown us that with uh, with uh, the classic internet the, the traditional internet they have shown us that with social media with a short interlude between 2009 and 2013, where social media was actually, it looked at sometimes as, as if it would get out of hand and uh, maybe the internet profits would be right and maybe uh, these new media would be uncontrollable because uh, if you you remember when Weibo came, Weibo came up in 2009, for three or four years there was something that that the People's Republic had never seen. There was an open debate. There was a free flow of information because the party had missed for some time, actually, um, the core of these new technologies. They thought it, it was just the same as the old, the traditional internet. And what they didn't see was if you have a sensor, uh, uh, like in the traditional internet that only needs 20 minutes to actually block or delete a certain comment, or an account if you're uh, uh, on social media, if you're dealing with uh, mobile phones where things happen in the course of seconds and minutes, if you need 20 minutes, you're actually 19 minutes and 50 seconds too late. Um, so they didn't realize that for three or four years and many people, including me, I was getting doubtful again and, and I was like, oh, maybe, maybe it is right. Maybe new technology is actually good for freedoms and is not controllable as they wanted. But then Xi Jinping took power and he showed us how quick it goes. It only took him in the summer of 2013. It, it took him eight weeks or something. And then Weibo as a means of political de debate was completely dead. And uh, uh, the party had regained um, the, the control over the internet and over social media. And uh, I think they have the same optimism uh, in regards to artificial uh, intelligence and also uh, big data. I think, uh, I mean, I can't speak too long, right? I'm supposed to be finished in 10 minutes, so I won't go into many details. Uh, one question, how far have they come uh, that sometimes, um, um, uh, for example, already in the spring of 2018, the People's Daily wrote in a tweet on Twitter. Twitter is forbidden in China. We all know that, but they use it for propaganda purposes. And so they wrote on their English language channel that already by now, the Skynet, which is the network of surveillance cameras that they, uh, artificial intelligence surveillance cameras that they have established in China, is capable of identifying uh, each and every single one of their 1.4 billion citizens in the course of one second. That sounded back then, uh, that's quite a statement. And uh, it, it, it sounds a little scary uh, in the beginning. They, you know, when they write these things in this chance, they're actually quite proud of these, uh, of these achievements. They, they see it as a, as a technological uh, achievement. Of course, also their argument is all these surveillance cameras are there for the security of the people. So they don't feel very often they have something to hide. Um, I, my first reaction was, and the first question you have to ask when they claim things like this, is that even true? You know, Is it true or was it true back then that they really could do that? And my feeling was, no, it wasn't true. It wasn't true back then. It will be true at some point. Maybe it's true uh, now, two, two years later. But um, the point with these statements and with these claims is it doesn't really matter whether they are true. The only thing that matters is that people believe that they are true. And this is one thing very central with this new high-tech surveillance state, I think, uh, that um, there is something going on that uh, much more than before, what they want is they want an internalization of control. They want each and every single citizen to be 
his or her own policeman. You know, you don't need the policeman at the street corner anymore if you yourself are doing all the uh, self-censorship and self-control. And that works very well when you feel that there is an all-seeing, all-knowing, all-powerful eye hovering above you, watching you all the time. And it might be the surveillance cameras, it might be your mobile phone uh, that you carry around uh, you in your pocket, or it might be uh, that you're part of the social credit system, the famous social credit system, which is also parts uh, was uh, um, established for economic reasons, but of course its second pillar is also the surveillance uh, people. But there as well as with the other uh, surveillance tools, I would argue that in the end, it's all about making you yourself control yourself. And this is something very smart. I would argue actually with all these new, you know, what Xi Jinping does, one thing Xi Jinping does is he wants complete control. He's a control freak. You know, some people, you could read in the beginning in many uh, newspaper headlines, Xi Jinping is the new Mao Zedong. Um, I mean, we all know that this is nonsense. Xi Jinping is completely different from Mao Zedong. And one of the main differences, obviously, is that Mao was this internal rebel. He, he loved chaos. He thrived in chaos. Uh, and the Cultural Revolution is one of the best examples for that. Uh, and Xi Jinping is very different. Obviously, he's a he's a he's a freak for control and for stability. He loves stability. He loves control. He quotes Mao very often, uh, though. And one of the quotes that he uses very often is uh, this 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 quote that it doesn't matter whether in the east or in the west or in the north or in the, or in the south, the party is the ruler of everything again or in the center. The party has to rule everything again. And this is also the reason why, why he's uh, curtailing so much of uh, civil society and uh, why all these freedoms that many of our friends uh, uh, used to enjoy in the past years and decades in China suddenly are gone under Xi Jinping because suddenly nothing is allowed anymore outside the realm of the party. If you if you actually act, if you want to act on something, you're not, you know, maybe you are allowed to be a feminist, but you're only allowed to be a feminist uh, um, in the future if you're a feminist inside the party, uh, the party lines. Any kind of organization uh, outside party uh, boundaries now is automatically suspicious. So Xi Jinping wants to regain total, total control. And um, he also wants to do it, obviously, with these uh, technological machines. And I would say uh, because really the, uh, 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 the technological means are so amazing now, there is something happening that I would say is that we are actually witnessing the return. Or let's say Xi Jinping is still, it's a bet that he's doing now. We still don't know whether he will succeed in the end. In the moment, at the moment, it looks as things are going not bad for him, actually. But it's still a bet. So if he wins his bet, if he's successful, I would argue that we are seeing the return of totalitarianism actually in disguise. Um, I mean, China, for the last years, it was always a dictatorship, even though many people in the West didn't dare utter this word anymore. We were doing so good business with China. So dictatorship was a little bit a distasteful word. We didn't really want to call China dictatorship. We called it an authoritarian state, something like this. Uh, but of course, the party itself never had these qualms. It's written in the party constitution uh, right in the beginning that uh, the party is the, it's the dictatorship of the people. So they were quite proud calling themselves a dictatorship all along. It was always a dictatorship. I always said that. But one thing, you know, many China bashers also, also uh, many years ago, they very often they used when they came from the ideological side, they used the word totalitarian. That was one of those. Uh, uh, um, really, really, it's like the worst word you can say. And, and I always used to say, that's completely nonsense. You know, China maybe was a totalitarian state under Mao Zedong, but it definitely was no totalitarian state all the years after Deng Xiaoping took power and during the reform and opening era, because the party actually pulled back from society. It gave freedoms and niches for people to actually do what they want. And it gave up control. This is what it did, right? Now, what we're seeing now is Xi Jinping retaking control. And then the other thing is, uh, you know, what, what, what uh, the totalitarian 
they did on the Mao is it was really trying to get into the last corner of your brain and it was trying to get into your bedroom and under your pillow and it managed to do that with the help of your wife or your children or whatever back then. And now you don't need your rel the relatives anymore. Now I said technology can do that. So they can, can get back into, the bra into your brain and they can get... Uh, 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 into your into your bedroom and they they go uh, to the toilet with you like uh, I guess most of you like me sometimes take you take your iPhone uh, with you when you go to the toilet and uh, uh, and it's actually quite scary uh, and they are watching your every step you know when you don't it's like my wife she uses this health health uh, mode thing on the on the iPhone uh, I disabled this but and every every evening she proudly tells me. Uh, that she has done 12,000 or 13,000 steps again. Uh, and I really think this is crazy. If you let uh, an, an, uh, a telephone actually do uh, this with you and we are delivering all these information to the high tech uh, companies residing in America and Silicon Valley. But in China, all this information of course goes also to state security. Uh, organs. So uh, one thing I would say, one thing is it's the internalization of control. They actually, it's the return of totalitarianism, but it's a much smarter totalitarianism. It's not a totalitarianism that is relying on everyday terror and violence, as it used to be the case under Mao Zedong and Stalin. You don't need that anymore nowadays. Nowadays, you have a very clever mix of George Orwell. You know, George Orwell was a, a very prophetic guy. I advise all of you to reread his books, actually. But with George Orwell, you can only explain at the most half of China. And we all know, you know, when, when you fly to China, you step out of the plane, you, you, you look at Shanghai, you look at all the glamour, you, 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 you drive through Beijing, you see all the expensive cars, you see uh, the nightlife, the restaurants, uh, you, you, you open the Chinese internet, and it's very colorful, very lively, all kinds of... And it's it's a, a mecca of consumerism and and, and commerce. And uh, uh, second thing I would I, I would say is actually so uh, China is much more a mix of George Orwell and Aldous Huxley actually Brave New World uh, uh, than it is an Orwellian state uh, alone. So this is this the this, the second thing. And one thing maybe one detail only. Uh, what they're doing with these new high-tech means. And I think it's quite an important detail because uh, it leads to something that is happening in the west of China. You know, already in the year 2017, uh, there was the vice minister of science and technology, Li Meng, in Beijing saying a sentence. He said, uh, with this new artificial intelligence technologies now, the party already, the, we, we can already know who will be a terrorist in the future. You know, we can know now already who will be a terrorist tomorrow. And I would say, you know, uh, brackets that he even meant, even if the guy himself doesn't even know himself that he's going to be a terrorist. So predictive policing is a big thing. With all this data collecting in all these databases, you know, they're trying to make profiles of potential uh, well, uh, in one party document, it says people who behave unnormally. So people who potentially who have the potential to disturb social stability and one place where we where we, where we see that very clearly uh, is uh, Xinjiang of course where with the establishment of all these re-education camps not only have you one of the uh, biggest you know camp gulag states uh, appearing uh, in the course of only two years, uh, incredible, the speed uh, that they did this with. But at the same time, Xinjiang is al also the prime example for this high-tech surveillance uh, inside China. And all the technologies that are being de developed in Beijing and Shenzhen are being tried out in Xinjiang first. And all the companies actually are being told by Beijing also to go to Xinjiang, which brought them in big troubles with uh, Donald Trump. They landed on some blacklists uh, in the United States because they are... Uh, they are supplying technology for the Xinjiang surveillance. But actually what's happening in Xinjiang is a huge predictive policing uh, program. All these people in the camps, you know, there were, as they had, have been estimated more than a million. They are not people who have committed crimes that they were indicted for. They have never 
They have never been indicted. They have never seen a court. There is no, they have never seen uh, uh, a lawyer. Uh, instead, uh, they have been chosen by all these data after actually the calculation and uh, uh, judgment of all the data that has been collected by them. And, and the data include GPS, uh, GPS uh, movements with their cars, but also mobile phone, uh, uh, mobile phone data, of course, surveillance camera data, who actually is moving together with whom but also birth control records, online shopping records, all different things. And then the algorithm in the end uh, tells some bureaucrat uh, that uh, actually, uh, and they have a platform, the platform in Xinjiang is called Joint Operation Platform. There's a very, uh, there's a very long Human Rights Watch report on it where you can find many detail on this platform. And uh, when you are actually deemed unreliable after all your data has been uh, examined, then you end up in one of those camps. So this is, I would say, where it has gone to its most extreme. And the thing is, if we look at Xinjiang, uh, we, it's probably not enough to you know, um, think these are all the Muslim, the potential Muslim terrorists, and it will never be... Uh, 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 this is not something you have to worry about if you live in the rest of China. I think a lot of those things that we're seeing in, Sh in Xinjiang will actually come to the rest of China as well, and they will be exported uh, into other countries. That's happening already as well. So my time is up. Just I haven't spoken about the third part of my book, but this is probably something we can do in the question and answer sessions. The third part, what what else is new about this new China of Xi Jinping, of course, is the new China dream where he actually uh, says uh, what we're working for as the Communist Party is the renaissance, the renaissance of the great Chinese civilization. Let China retake its place uh, in the center of the world. Uh, and uh, um, with that, today, together with that, uh, a whole new foreign policy, actually, a foreign policy that is a lot more assertive, sometimes even aggressive, than it used to be, um, and something that is actually going to be a big challenge for us because uh, on the one hand, you have now a China, you know, Xi Jinping uh, on the party congress in 2017, November, he stood there and he said, first of all, he said, we, this is now the moment where we are going back to the center of the world. He said that. And then he said, we are willing, and of course he wanted to appear very benevolent, and, and he said, we are willing to give the world the gift of the Chinese wisdom, Zhongguo Zhihui. But of course, he doesn't mean Confucius and Lao Tzu and whatever. Uh, what he means is just the wisdom of the Communist Party uh, of China, which is just the wisdom of a Leninist dictatorship. I think this is something we have to bear in mind very often. When you actually do a systemic analysis of China's political system, then you will find that the Communist Party itself actually engages in a kind of Orientalism when it claims to be this kind of, you know, it's all Zhongguo Te Se, it's all the, the Chinese, uh, um, uh, it's, it's all socialism uh, uh, with, with Zhongguo Te Se, it's all, and it's all a very Chinese model and nobody can understand China because only Chinese can understand China because we are this country with such a long history. We are so different from everybody else. While in fact, when you look at it very closely, uh, it's not a lot more else than uh, good old fashioned Leninism now uh, with an update, with an high tech, uh, with an high tech update. But that is challenging for us because uh, the new foreign policy of China actually means that um, on the one hand, uh, they're trying to go into international institutions now. I mean, they have defined now very clearly their interests and they have made clear that they are willing to defend uh, those interests all around the planet now and uh, in a much more aggressive way than they used to and on the one hand um, they're doing this in internet we're seeing they're doing this in international organizations and obviously the absence of the united states donald trump's really erratic and irrational foreign policy and his pulling back has uh, it's a huge gift for the chinese leadership and has given them the vacuum to actually to actually go ahead with a lot of their plans and then the second thing is that um, not only are they being active in uh, the international organizations, uh, 
but of course also uh, in our own countries. And a lot of this activity, of course, is, is legitimate and all of our countries do this. But uh, what I would say and what I would say where we have really have to be careful is uh, we really have to define some red lines because what also Xi Jinping and the Communist Party have said long before we have said is this is actually a new competition of systems. The competition of systems is back, you know, and there again, we have a China, we have a Communist Party claiming their system is superior. They actually say their democracy is superior. They have the much more effective uh, uh, democracy. And the West, while the West is going down in chaos and decline, and their prime examples are, of course, Donald Trump and the UK with Brexit. It's like, uh, actually, actually, CCTV had a great headline uh, last year once uh, saying, is liberal democracy dead after Brexit and Trump? So, uh, so they're having a field day always showing uh, um, Donald Trump uh, on their evening news and sometimes also some Brexit scenes. Uh, the thing about this is, and then I stop and, um, and let you ask some questions, is that we really have to be careful because um, sometimes, you know, we are open societies, and this is the old dilemma of open societies, and uh, that sometimes um, they use, uh, like the Russians do it, but in a completely different way, they use open societies with covered means. And this is something uh, where we just have to say, stop, this is, uh, 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 we can't really allow this. And this is something where we have to stand up for our values and for our norms. and. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, in the end, it's uh, coming back to us. Uh, we are actually, I would say, liberal democracy in Europe is in the midst of a perfect storm. Maybe we find ourselves in a perfect storm. And responsible for this are, on the one hand, people like Donald Trump, or mainly Donald Trump in the United States, and the right-wing populists uh, in Europe which actually actively try to subvert our own, some of the norms and values that we have, but also the structures like the European Union, for example. So, uh, and on the other hand, you have the outsiders like Russia and China who are trying um, their best to, uh, um, to actually uh, subvert some of these structures. And while everybody was, talking all the time about Trump and about the right-wing populists and about Russia. At least when I started the book, nobody was talking about China. That we know has changed a great deal. Now it seems everybody has, is talking about China. And before I go on and on and on, I stop here and um, you just ask your questions. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Kai. That's very, very thought-provoking. Um, we already have quite a few questions being put to you. Um, and let me just remind everybody that the floor is now opened and it will be helpful if you would in putting the questions through the Q&A box to identify yourself as to who you are. It helps me um, to understand where the question comes from. If you would like your identity not to be disclosed when I read out your questions, it will be helpful if you could uh, say that at the top of your questions, in which case I will not mention your name. Um, Kai, before I open the floor, I would like to do a bit of nitpicking with you. Um, you've got a very interesting title, the, particularly the, the title for the talk and the title for the book in the German edition, which is the uh, reinvention of dictatorship. Hearing your talk and thinking about what you said, I'm not entirely quite sure why you thought that reinvention of dictatorship encapsulates the message you were trying to put across. Because I thought the message you're putting across is fairly clear, which is that what we are now seeing in place is a kind of, if you will, digital Leninism. That yes. is some kind of Leninist dictatorship has never, in fact, disappeared in China. It might have receded somewhat 
at an earlier age, in a, during the earlier of the reform and opening periods under Deng Xiaoping. But even Deng Xiaoping had made it very clear from the very beginning when he was talking about that the need for China to hide its capabilities and to bite full time and insisting on the four upholds, that it was blatantly clear that there was never any intention on the part of the party state to give up power or to change in any serious way that will infringe upon the leadership of the Communist Party of China. It was a matter of timing when the party will reassert its effective control. And what we have seen is that technology has done so. And in the, in the examples you have cited, both Orwell and Huxley, and in fact, we don't even need to include Huxley if we just only look at Or Orwell, from the transformation of the Orwellian stories of animal farms to 1984, we already saw that transformation of the old fashioned Leninist dictatorship in animal farm to a kind of a digital future in 1984. Orwell just didn't understand that the technology, technology could do so much more than what he thought. And in fact, the technology has is able to do so much more now. There is arguably no need for the Communist Party, whether it's under Xi Jinping or somebody else in the future, to secure a full return of totalitarianism. Because totalitarianism Im Im implied and require summary control across the board. The digital technology allowed them to have smart control so it's not actually even necessary for the full-scale rest restoration of totalitarianism. In that case, why would something like digital Leninism or some other permutation not encapsulate your message better than the reinvention of dictatorship, implying dictatorship had broken or disappeared or something and therefore needs to be reinvented? No, no, no. I think, I think actually... <laughs> I think actually we agree on nearly all points. I think it's probably a matter of terms and a matter of definition. Uh, the digital Leninism is exactly what it is. This is a, but why I am calling it the reinvention of dictatorship is because it has never been there in this, in this, to this extent and in this manner. It's like the possibilities of control and suppression with these new technolo technologies have never been seen on this planet like this. And I think that this is not only a matter of quantity. I think if you have really a development and an advancement where, where um, the extent of control and the possibility of, um, uh, of, of the extent of the possibility of control is enlarging on such a huge scale, that it actually becomes a matter of uh, not only quantity, but also quality. And it's, it's actually a new thing. This is really something that in this form we haven't seen before. And I would agree that it would still be just uh, um, uh, another mode of Leninism, completely. They have never given up Leninism, and you're completely right with this. And um, the people who were dreaming these kind of, this kind of China fantasy, that they had and that the party actually was secretly paving the way uh, for a transition to democracy um, they were right they were wrong uh, uh, on basically every minute of uh, of the last decades um, so um, yeah i i would still say um, this is if in the end it all works out and if the whole of china uh, becomes an object of control as Xinjiang is already, you know. Now you don't need to put people into camps, all of them. But if you, uh, it's enough if you have uh, all the surveillance uh, technology around for every Chinese city as you have it already at the moment um, for every uh, city in Xinjiang. I think we are talking about really, this is a complete new level. This is a complete new 
uh, mode of living also for the people there. And this is a new kind of Leninism. I would still say that. Okay, thank you to Kai. And now we already have nearly a dozen questions uh, in the Q&A box. Um, Kai, if you could tr try to answer them as succinctly as you can, then I'll try okay, will to- you, Will you read, you pick the questions and read them to me or? I'll, I'll pick the questions and read them to you. Okay. Uh, so that you, you, you don't have to worry about that. I will, I will try to um, uh, fit in all the questions if possible. Now you were talking about the um, Uyghur situation, and there is a in Xinjiang, and there's a question I think so, uh, somewhere here who asked you about that question, that issue exactly. I think the question was that: Do you see the Xinjiang situation as something that will cause a change in how the West will? examine its relationship with China. I think that question came from, uh, it's an email name, so I'll just leave it there. That's Are a we very at the good. point of seeing a change in Western attitude to, towards China because of Xinjiang? That's a very good question because um, of course, this debate has been going on, I think, in all our countries, and we've seen we've seen Donald Trump, for one, uh, actually using Xinjiang um, as a pretext uh, for some sanctions and uh, bringing up certain blacklists uh, for companies and also Xinjiang officials. Uh, this is so far. I think the only practical outcome I've seen in any Western countries in a change of policies, I haven't seen, I haven't seen it in my own country, in Germany. Uh, there's a big debate in Germany because Volks, uh, not a big debate, that's too big a word, but Volkswagen, you know, the big German car maker, they actually have a plant in Xinjiang. And so uh, they get asked this question now very often on press conferences, that has changed. Xinjiang is on the map suddenly, Uyghurs on, are on the map, but we all as China, you know, students, students of China, we all know that uh, probably until two years ago, people all over the world, they didn't even know what a Uyghur person was. The words just didn't exist. So this is something new. It has sunk into our consciousness. I'm not sure about policy change actually. Uh, as far as the influence of Xinjiang, I think it's one puzzle in a, it's one piece of a puzzle in a bigger uh, mosaic now of things that have happened that will lead or is leading to a change like Xinjiang together with what has happened in Hong Kong, together with how China has handled the coronavirus crisis, and, but also its foreign diplomacy after Corona with this kind of, you know, wolf warrior diplomats out, outbursts and stuff. I think all of this together has led to a sort of awakening in, in most European societies, actually. Suddenly people for the first time, I think on a bigger scale, actually realize what you were talking about just now, Steve, that actually the core, what actually the core of the system is, that actually this is still a Leninist. And what kind of a system is this? This is still a Leninist system uh, with uh, uh, practices uh, that come from, this, from come, the, come from this tradition. So for the first time they have opened their eyes and because it somehow fits into the broader uh, 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 picture and it fits uh, the, in, in the case of Donald Trump, it fits his agenda, his election agenda at the moment. There you have, I think, uh, when we talk about the United States, it's a very short term, probably not too reliable change of politics because Donald Trump is on record saying really, uh, you know, uh, nasty things also to Chinese counterparts where he basically, he understands, you know, them putting Uyghur people in camps. Uh, he's on record for saying this one, things like this. I think in the case of Donald Trump, it's really, he's only playing with this. And 
uh, if he, if it suits him, he he might do a 180 degree turnaround. Okay, this is my daughter. Thank you. She wants her iPad. Um, in the case of the Europeans, I would say we might see some readjustment of China politics. I am not too sure how big a factor Xinjiang is playing in all this. Um, I think uh, it might be too optimistic on the human rights front uh, you know, if you actually credited the Xinjiang situation too much for this. I'm a I'm, on this, I'm a little cynical. I would okay. say uh, it's all the other things together. Oh, okay. Um, we, we, we really do have a lot of questions. So if we could be more succinct, uh, Kai, okay, okay. we'll be able to answer more, more of them. Um, there is a follow up question to, to, the, to the very long answer you have given. And if we could be very short with the answer. And essentially, the question is about uh, whether it is now outdated for the West to take on moral condemnation, condemnation of China, since China is now confident and, of course, modern and powerful. I don't know whether the main point about bringing up human rights was moral condemnation. It might have seemed so. I don't think so. I think the main point about bringing up human rights, I think it's actually part of a real, of also real, real politic, as we call it, uh, human rights. And in the end, uh, it's much more about defending our own values and actually, uh, you know, keeping our own integrity. And that's not only a theoretical viewpoint at the moment where we are now, when we look at liberal democracies, you know, I think we're far beyond the point where everybody could harbor the illusion that we could influence China, actually, and we, we could make China a better place. At the moment, I think, you know, if we bring up these issues and if we, uh, and if we tell China, stop here, and not more. It's actually a real, it's, it's the outcome of a real realistic politics that we see that these kind of repressive policies and uh, these the human rights violations are actually uh, no longer, in the end, their effects will no longer be confined inside China's borders and they will infect all of us and it will come to us and it will haunt us. So I think at the moment when we talk about human rights and liberal norms and values, it's actually really about we we have to we we, we have to talk about us again. Okay, we got about twenty two minutes left, and we have something like seventeen questions on the book in the chat. Okay, so one minute per question. Okay. Um, there is a question about what do you think companies like Amazon, HSBC, or Volkswagen should do? Should they insist on the rights of their workers? Should they organize um, independently of the Communist Party before they open up factories in China or make other investments in China? Do you see that happening? Well, they probably, you know, organize independently. Is the question, does it mean like organize the workers independently or? I think the question is, do you, th do you think that they should be doing it? I think implicitly, therefore, is do you think that they will be doing it too? Okay, I think the main question with companies is I'm not advocating at all that one shouldn't do business anymore uh, with China. Not at all. Of course, we should. We should keep, uh, you know, Xi Jinping in some ways trying to seal off his country ideologically and uh, spiritually. We have a lot of interest going on that the country has, that channels are open and the country stays open, that fresh air comes into China. And obviously trade business is, is, is a big part of that. But what companies really should do, they should get, and all of us, we should get rid of the naivete that has defined so much of our interaction uh, with China. And some of it has been real naivete and some of it has just been acted. And I would say in the case of economic actors, very often it was more interest than real blindness. It was more uh, business interest. And I think we really have to, they, and they also should draw a red line where in the end it is about really, uh, it, it is about our values. And, it is, and that starts with the treatment of workers in China, but it goes on with how they behave and how they let themselves being dictated to behave by the Communist Party. When a German car company like Mercedes-Benz 
um, actually apologizes for you for using a quote uh, of the Dalai Lama in one of their Instagram accounts. This is something that just can't happen. If when a German uh, one of the biggest science publisher on the planet, uh, Springer Nature, it's a German company based in Berlin. When they agree to the request of Chinese censors to censor all their websites that are accessible from China, to clear to clear them from all content that has to do with Tibet, Taiwan, uh, and Tiananmen. This is <laughs> this is the point when I say, okay, this is where private companies have gone too far. Okay, um, there is a question from. Uh, and somebody who's ethnic Chinese, and the question starts with a statement, which is that some Chinese do not really see Xi Jinping as a Mao, but they see Xi Jinping more as a Yuan Shikai figure. Yuan Shikai was, of course, the uh, general who became the first president of the uh, Republic of China, properly after the revolution, when Sun Yat-sen handed over powers to him. And the question was also about um, what, therefore, do you think about how this digital Leninism affect nationalism in China? So the person asking the question is meaning he's he's a nationalist. He's more a nationalist, like Yuan Shikai. No, no, let's forget about what that person is whether he is a nationalist or not. Because I don't really understand the question. The question how is it affecting parts. nationalism in China? Uh, the, the important thing to remember is if you, if you have this digital Leninism and this regime of high-tech surveillance with, uh, you know, self-control and self, that it works then, it works very well if it's embedded into a whole uh, system of other other things that actually uh, uh, that actually keep it balanced, and one of those things, uh, one of those things is material wealth. Is the the party had always delivered? We we can't forget that materially, right? I mean, uh, so uh, many in the urban elite have always been very satisfied with the party. This is one thing, and the second thing, very important, is the point of this question: is uh, uh, the nationalist and also militaristic. Uh, 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 education that Xi Jinping has actually strengthened and that starts from kindergarten. And I think that is something we should also be worried about. I think it's much stronger than it used to be. I, for 30 years, I've been living in China and I had never, ever encountered things, uh, encountered like uh, xenophobia, uh, at least, you know, I'm not black. Black people might have uh, experienced it differently. Uh, or, um, but uh, there is uh, the rise, together with the rise of nationalism, there's also a rise of hostility suddenly towards foreigners. And uh, and this is something, you know, it's still not really, you know, it hasn't uh, exploded in any way, but this is something very dangerous. And I think Xi Jinping is actually playing on this and he's using this. I mean, he's using the nationalism for the day because he knows that economic, economically, one day China will actually also be uh, uh, will catch up with the rules of uh, with the laws of gravity, and it won't grow anymore. And for that moment, when the internal conflicts will actually break up, he will need that nationalism. Okay, somebody asks a very simple, straightforward question. I think uh, there may be others who will be interested in her question as well. So, if you could use thirty seconds or maximum one minute to explain this, and that is the, the term cult of personality. Uh, some in the audience don't understand what the cult of personality is, so if you could do it in 30 seconds, Kai. Oh, well, uh, it already started in 2014-15 when suddenly people started writing I think the question is, again. what does it mean? What is, the, what is a cult of personality? Uh, well, I can only give examples. When when Chinese songwriters write uh, songs about Xi Jinping again, when Chinese painters paint uh, oil pictures in oil of Xi Jinping that are being published, when in uh, uh, in in churches, in Christian churches in Zhejiang, the picture of Jesus is being taken down and the picture of Xi Jinping is uh, is being hung up again. When party functionaries from Sichuan travel travel to the northeast to a tree that Xi Jinping has one planted to sing Xi Jinping songs and recite his poems. This is a cult of personality. Okay, 
There's a question from a student from KCL, King's College London. And the question is about what you thought um, about how China is using social media to interfere with the politics of other country, whether you're talking yes. about fake news or some other forms. I would say, okay, one thing I would say, if you talk about influence operations, I have, for a long time, I have said, everybody's talking about Russia, nobody's talking about China, while China actually is doing so much more on such a broader front. They're going into universities, into think tanks, they're trying to go into our media and stuff. But one thing they never really did like the Russians in the Russian way was actually the social media thing in to an extent that Russia had done it. You know, the classical Russia, the influence operation thing is using its trolls and uh, bots uh, on, on Twitter and Facebook and influencing our elections and the Brexit uh, vote uh, through this means. And actually China was absent from that game for a long time. I think that is changing slowly now. Uh, we've seen first examples for, uh, uh, for this in Hong Kong first, during the Hong Kong demonstrations last year, when suddenly Facebook and Twitter announced that they had, uh, they had actually deleted hundreds and thousands of uh, of fake accounts, uh, uh, which they thought were actually originated in China. And we're seeing it again, we have seen it again now during the coronavirus crisis, where for the first time in Europe, actually, I saw that there was a, a, a large scale effort also by trolls and by social media, but to get the Chinese narrative, like, you know, the virus, first the virus is an Italian virus, then the virus originated in the United States. Uh, things like this, but also with positive, their mask diplomacy, but also helped by a lot of, by an army of bots, uh, uh, the planes landing with the face masks and stuff. That for me were the two, the first two times that I saw the Chinese actually really actively employing these instruments. So far, they haven't done it to an extent as the Russians have. Okay, there is a question from somebody from SOAS, which is to ask you about uh, in light of your talk, how should the West share data with China? Can we actually share any data with uh, China in, in regards to the digital economy in the future? Yeah, I think this is one of the central questions. And I think uh, every society has to actually start um, discussing that question. We are starting discussion. We are, we're having this discussion right now. You had it in England, we have it in Germany with the Huawei question, right? And I think it's very important uh, that uh, we come to a point where we agree where the border, where the border line is here, actually. Uh, obviously, there are probably some kind of data. The TikTok uh, example, for example, I would say, I don't agree with Trump on that. I don't think this is something, you know, this is not a relevant, systemic relevant uh, thing. Uh, of course, there's a lot of things wrong with TikTok, but probably not more wrong than with Facebook and with Twitter. And we Europeans, actually, we should point to the finger with our fingers to all of those. But there are other things like Huawei and the 5G network, where it clearly comes to the core of critical national security infrastructure. And I would say there, there's no way that we should share uh, this kind of data and uh, infrastructure with China. And we always have to remember, uh, remember that in the case of China, a private company in China is not the same thing uh, as in our countries. They are obliged to cooperate uh, with the authorities there, and they're obliged to hand over the data if the national security organs wish so. So the questions in the case of 5G and a company like Huawei is never the one that is posed so often, so often in so many countries, uh, namely the question, can we trust Huawei? That question is so, totally meaningless in the end. The question we should really ask is, can we trust the Communist Party of China? And only if we can answer that question with a yes, then we can share this data with them. Okay, I have a question here from Graham Hutchings, which is directly about something you said. Um, he asked you whether you could elaborate on the point you make about Xi Jinping being engaged in a bet. Why might he lose his bet? And what will happen if he does? 
Yes. Uh, why might he lose his bet? I think um, it's not a very clever thing to go down the way that he does maybe in the end because on the surface, he looks like a very strong man. On the surface, he makes he does make China strong. And this is why many people in China actually like him for that, right? Like many Russians like Putin. Um, it works. These kind of things work with uh, parts of the population um, if the propaganda I is in this way. But if you look closely, uh, if, you, if you really, if you shut down all channels of feedback, if you, if you silence all the critics, if you only allow yes man next to you, it makes you blind. It makes the system blind and it makes the system prone to errors. And actually, I would argue that the coronavirus crisis actually was a very good example for that, because if you remember in the first two months, it was a complete and utter system failure. And the Wuhan cadres and everything with the secrecy, they were trying to, uh, to hide everything and they were, they were actually uh, uh, silencing the whistleblowers uh, and everything. And if you compare that, to SARS 2003, they, they had also been silencing whistleblowers back then, but it was much faster. It, it, the things came much faster to light in 2003 because back then we still had independent journalism, a kind of independent journal. We still had the Nanfang, Joe Moore, the Southern Weekend, this investigative uh, newspaper in China that actually came out and brought these stories and brought them to the attention of Beijing. And suddenly now we have Xi Jinping's system, uh, which is much more airtight than it used to be for the for the last decades and much more blind and he actually uh, he has like uh, uh, what's his name Xu Professor Xu who was arrested for his essay on the coronavirus crisis he writes in his essay that Xi Jinping with his policy has actually taken away he has taken down uh, the social immunity of China and I think this is also a big change of for, for the a danger for the Communist Party I think he is actually shooting in his own foot with a lot of the re-centralization and repression he does. And what happens in the end, if he fails or if he gets into trouble, this is where I come back to the nationalism thing. If he comes, if he, get, if he gets into trouble, if really, you know, I mean, uh, I was never one of those who, who predicted a big collapse uh, uh, of China, no way. But if you have stagnation alone, you know, economic stagnation, or a little bit of a recession in the next year. It will come, inevitably it will come. Uh, what happens then if the internal conflicts of China suddenly break up, the social inequalities? Though it, it calls itself a communist uh, country, but at the same time it has some of the uh, highest wealth gaps on the planet. Uh, you know, Thomas Piketty's newest book uh, is not allowed to be print, printed in China because they wanted to censor it because he writes about the inequality of China in his new book. And uh, uh, and this is the point then where I fear um, that Xi Jinping actually might use something like, uh, it could be the Senkaku, the Diaoyutai Islands, it could be Taiwan, my guess is Taiwan maybe, uh, to deflect from internal crisis and internal dissatisfaction and to unite the country nationalistically behind him by creating an artificial uh, crisis. And that's where it gets dangerous. Okay, there, let me just bring in another question from uh, a SOAS student, which is about whether you think the current aggressive expansionist policy of Beijing in South China Sea, East China Sea, and in Africa is part of Xi Jinping's plans to reinvent the Chinese dictatorship and restore China's former glory? The short answer is yes. <laughs> the very short answer, yes, I think it is. Also, we, we, we shouldn't forget uh, that this, uh, the, his global ambitions, they feed very well into the domestic politics. I would, I would say a lot of this China dream is actually aimed at domestic consumption also, you know? It helps him with his with uh, to stabilize his power. Okay, complete change of uh, track. There's a question about Hong Kong, and the question is about whether you think Hong Kong, how you think Hong Kong might be affected by this high tech authoritarianism used on the mainland of China. I think it's already started to be affected. Like when we saw all the the people taking 
uh, part in the demonstrations, uh, actually actively, you know, some of them leaving their mobile phones at home, some of them uh, deleting certain apps because they were afraid that they were already being tracked. I think Hong Kong, Hong Kong is a very, very uh, good example uh, um, for the ambitions uh, of Xi Jinping. I don't think the high tech aspect though is the most important one. I think, you know, as we see uh, the actual classical means of repression and politics work are probably enough um, to pacify Hong Kong, to harmonize Hong Kong mm -hmm. in the eyes of Xi Jinping. The problem, the question, the big question is why does he do it? Why does he do it now? And I would say it's a very easy answer. It's, well, first of all, he probably does it now because uh, with all the Corona things going on, he feels he's not being watched as much, but very clearly he feels threatened by the example of Hong, Hong Kong. A central part of the narrative of Xi Jinping's uh, Communist Party is the Chinese people is only ever rife and ready for a government like ours. This is the only government that suits China. And Chinese people per se, uh, uh, you know, it's not in the DNA of Chinese people to be democratic and free. And of course, Hong Kong is the perfect counter example to that. Hong Kong is a brilliant example of, and it's a, it's a laboratory. It's like Taiwan. It's a laboratory of what happens to Chinese people. Chinese tradition, black hair, you know, black eyes, uh, same DNA, same language, same culture, same tradition. Actually, the same tradition that you as a CCP are so proud of, much better preserved because you destroyed it in the People's Republic under Mao Zedong. You smashed it into pieces. In Hong Kong, the tra tradition is much more alive. And still, these are the people who are actually, you know, these people growing up, and not in a democracy because Great Britain never gave them democracy, but it gave them the rule of law, the freedom of arbitrary rule and, uh, and um, fairness, a fair system. And how do the same people feel? How do they act? How do they think? What do they dream of when they grow up under such complete different circumstances? And this is a thorn in the side of the Communist Party. He has to get rid of that. Okay, got three minutes. I want to squeeze in two more questions. Yeah. One is that a, a follow up on your answer there, which is a question from Teresa, who wants to see your seek your view on whether you think the Chinese people will accept economic growth and benefits in return for giving up their freedom of speech and other freedoms. Well, they have accepted it for many years now, haven't they? It works very well. Okay, the let's, let's move on. Um, it's a question from somebody who is working as a consultant in London, who, would, who says that um, even China must have seen that how the American behave as leader in, in, in the world is not working and would therefore China see the wisdom of operating as a leader among equals? I'm, yeah, the question is what does China want in the end, right? Do they want to rule the world? Do they want to lead the world? They certainly want to defend their interests now anywhere on the world, but do they want, well, they don't, they don't want to rule the world, I would say that, uh, and they don't want to conquer the world. Do they want to lead the world in any meaningful way? So far, they haven't shown the willingness to. On the contrary, whenever there's leadership, you know, I mean, they're playing along in some parts, but they really haven't taken up a leadership role. It's much more of, a, I think, a question of, still at the moment, a question of faith, probably, and a question of, um, of image and being perceived as one of the mightiest powers in the world. Do they really want to lead the world? not sure they for sure what they do want if you remember there was a famous sentence by one american president saying what is the role of america in the world it is to make the world safe for democracy what china certainly does want to do now what the communist party wants to do it wants to make the world safe for autocracy this is what they want to do together with the russians actually do they want to lead? Do they want to rule? At the moment, I would say no. This is also why I would say and why I'm telling everybody when they, this is a question that comes inevitably in all of my talks uh, in Germany, they ask me, do we have to fear China? And in the end, I always say no, 
we don't have to fear China. In the end, it's really about us. You know, we, we really have to defend our strength. We have to recognize that we still have strength, that democracy actually is the better system. I say this as someone having lived in China for nearly 20 years. Uh, democracy is still the better and it is still the more effective system. But the big danger is that we are actually that we are actually too timid at the moment. And we are like, I don't know, we're paralyzed. And, and, and it's really like a self-fulfilling prophecy that we are giving up our democracy and that we're actually staring at this, at this fantasy of these wise dictators who have invented a much more effective system. Uh, I would say this is nonsense. And uh, I would say, and maybe end with this, the only, the only people we have to fear are ourselves. Okay. Regrettably, we have run up against the clock. So I must apologize to the others who have sent in questions either through the chat box or the Q&A uh, uh, box. Um, I have not been able to fit in all the questions, but let me do thank Kai for giving us a very stimulating um, evening of conversations. I was slightly surprised that we did not have somebody who directly uh, not believe in what you have to say. And yeah, contribute. I was waiting for the hostile questions. <laughs> um, but it wasn't there. But anyway, thank you very much. And thank you also to all of you who have taken part in this webinar. Uh, we will have another webinar next week. And you can find all the details on our website. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you very much, Steve.